right, well, welcome back to another episode of Redeemer Unfiltered, where you never quite know what's going to come out of our mouths. Um, today, I'm joined by the one and only Jeff Lowen, our executive pastor. All right, so um, for every podcast this season, we're kind of focusing on a different aspect of the vision we rolled out. So we talked about strengthening our church. Um, I did two with one with Jericho, one with Bill. Now we're talking about strengthening families. And so one of those things or two of those things is going to be marriage and parenting. Well, we're not going to be an all-inclusive podcast today, but scratch the surface. But um, so why in the world did I ask ask you? Let's just let me ask some questions real quick. Um, how many years have you been married? So coming up on 44. 44. How many kids do you have? And I'm only 43 years old, so that's got to be good. <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> uh, we have five kids. And how many grandkids? Uh, 23. So now we know why you were asked to talk about marriage and parenting. Yeah, and at least the <laughs> biological side of things. Yeah. Well, um, let's let's jump into marriage. We'll talk marriage first. And before we get into kind of our own wisdom and things that we've learned over the years, I thought we'd just do a, a quick, just look quick biblical overview. Um, what's the what's the primary scripture people go to for a wedding or for just a biblical framework of marriage? Do you, you know off the top of your head? Uh, not, not exactly. I would say that obviously Genesis from the very beginning. Yeah, Genesis um, 1 to yeah. get to. Um, I go to Ephesians 5. Yeah. And so in Ephesians 5, um, I'd say it, it helps us, one, chapter 5 helps us understand, like, what's the purpose of marriage? And so verse 1 says, be imitators of God. And, and so we want to show the world who God is, what he's like, how he loves. And he shows us how we do that through our, our ethics, through our speech, um, through our marriages, through our parenting. And so when he gets to the point of marriage, it's really in the context of marriage is meant to point people to God's yeah. love for us. So purpose of marriage is to point others to Jesus. Um, but then we see some, some two big concepts, one for women, one for men. And the, the first one for women is to be submissive. Um, how, like when you hear that, how, what goes to your mind? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Throw the hot potato at me. Right. That kind of thing. Um, well, obviously once, once you study that passage and you get a better understanding of what it is, uh, it's not as scary as the world likes to make it. Yeah. Um, and we, we tend to treat it as if it's somehow that she is subservient and it's not, it's a headship thing where even in the garden from the beginning, God stops and says, somebody's going to be responsible for the outcomes of this. Yeah. And that ends up being the man. But as far as the rest, I mean, I love what scripture does with the whole helpmate thing. And it uses a word that's used for God as well. And it's more of a partner. It's somebody that's there. So it has to do with order and how yeah. God lays it out. And it is not a subservient thing at all. Um, so it's, it's actually far more refreshing when you really study what's going on with that. Yeah. I love that. Um, whenever I do weddings, I'll point out that one, it's, it's not the same word as obey. And yeah. so obey is, it doesn't matter what you think you're going to do where submit is actually voluntary. It's yeah. something that the wife gives. It's not something the husband demands. Um, and then also we, I like to point out that, that the imagery of the, the rib is yeah. a couple standing side by side, not the husband being like, I'm on top. Yep. Um, but if there has to be a leader, it's a, it's, it's done side by side, not. Yeah. I mean, it, if for anything, it should scare the the man more yeah. because it says, Hey, you have a responsibility here and you've got to fulfill that role. Yeah. Then I also love to point out what you just said that um, when Eve is called a helper, if we think like, Oh, like she needs to go make him a sandwich or something like <laughs> she does the laundry. But truth is like that word helper throughout the rest of the old Testament is pretty much used almost synonymously for the Holy spirit, yeah. which is not yeah. weakness, but power. So it's basically saying like, Hey Eve, you have strengths that Adam needs for this marriage to thrive. Yeah. And so it's a, it's a picture of strength. So it's not a, it's not a bad thing. It's like, Oh, this is actually, he's saying I'm powerful. Like I've, I have strengths that the marriage needs. Yep. So when you start, like, so when you start to study it, it becomes a much more beautiful picture. And, um, I also have found myself in some marriage counseling where I've, where I've had to point out that submission, um, you don't have to always submit. And so what I mean by that is if your husband's trying to lead you into sin, you're not called to just go like, well, I've, Bible says submit. It's like, no, there's times to, to not, but the husband should be leading in such a way that you trust him exactly um, to lead you towards Christ, not away from Christ. But if he's leading you into sin or something wrong, like you don't have to be like, Oh, the Bible says I've got to submit. It's like, no, you can stand up. So it's voluntary. You give it, hopefully the husband earns it and, and it's someone worth 
yeah. voluntarily following. Yeah, so. and I think that's especially true with abusive relationships and things like that as well. Is it's that it's not just a carte blanche that hey, you got to do whatever. Yeah, it it does come with uh, godly principles and parameters around it. And then when he gets to the men, it's a lot more to the men than the women. But the, the, list. And the and the and the but the biggest part of it's serving. You should serve your wives. So what 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 do you think when you think about being a husband as a servant leader? Well, that's a big one in the sense that um, that from the very beginning, it's, it uses the example of Christ. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And that picture is literally, how did he do that? He was nailed to the cross. Yeah. That's how Christ loved the church. So when you look at it, it's like, man, guys, your, your number one thing is to die to self. Yeah. It's uh, putting ourselves to death and literally coming in as, a, as an opportunity in a Christ mindset that I would die to die for her, that yeah. I would lay down my life for her. Yeah, that's good. One of my favorite um, illustrations I heard was, I think it was, I was like on a Focus on the Family podcast, but it was talking about a ballet. Mm -hmm. And um, he said, he said, imagine the ballet. He's like, people go to see the woman. You know, her, her beauty, her strength, her agility. Um, and he goes, he's like, and so then the man is there and, and she can actually be more because of his presence, because he can toss her, he can catch her, he can spin her. But at the end, you know, he goes into the shadows, breathing heavy, knowing that his job is done while she stands in the spotlight and gets the praise. Um, he said, you know, for a, a husband, you know, to serve his wife, it's, it's making the beautiful more beautiful. Yeah, um, it's, I like it's that. Our, our job is to hold our wives up and for, for to help the world see her as beautiful as we see her. And, um, and I thought it was like, man, what a, what a beautiful picture of like, Hey, like I'm serving my wife to make the beautiful, more beautiful, um, to, to help others see her as, as I see her, but ultimately to see him as God sees him. So, yep. yeah. Yep. So if that's a, that's like a quick, quick rundown of a, a biblical framework of marriage. Um, let's just get now kind of more to life experience we've, we've seen, um, or experienced. And so I'd love to hear from you, like what's some of the best marriage advice you ever got? Well, maybe some marriage advice that you're like, Hey, I've been giving this out. It's pretty good. Uh, yeah. Well, there's a ton of advice out there. I mean, it just doesn't end and it doesn't mean it's all good. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of people that say some, some crazy things. Uh, for me, I, I think that, um, well, let me let me start that answer by saying I think it's awesome that you you would wonder a question like that. If you're married or even if you're thinking of being married, you should be a student of this. Like That's this should really be your question. Like, how do I become a better spouse? In yeah. fact, oftentimes with dating couples, um, some will have a list of everything they're looking for in a spouse. And what Eugenie and I often encourage is that uh, it's an old quote from a guy named Charlie Shedd is that marriage isn't so much finding the right person as being the right person. So we typically have this list of what we're looking for in a it's person. Like be the person you want to be married. That you, that exactly. Be no. the person that you want to marry wants to be married to. Yeah. <laughs> so, the, and what happens is it, in this typically is a little weighted, like you'll find girls will have in their journals, a list of everything they're looking for in a guy. Guys typically aren't even thinking about it. They don't have the list at all. But the concept is, is do you have an equal list that is the things that I should be doing? Like um, marriage is not so much finding the right person as being the right person. What are the things that I can do to be a great spouse when that becomes my responsibility? Yeah. So with that in mind, um, I asked my parents early on, uh, they had a great marriage. Um, and I went to them and said, look, I'm looking for advice. I'm, I'm married now. And how do I, how do I love you, Jeannie? How do we have a great marriage? How did you guys do it? And also we started having kids. So how do you do parenting? <laughs> so my dad gave the marriage advice and he stopped and he said, when you get home from work, be ready to start work. And I was like, uh, what does that mean, dad? And he says, well, in the morning, I get up, I take a shower, I put on fresh new clothes, I put on some cologne, I brush my teeth, I'm I'm looking my best, I'm smelling my best, I'm all my best, and then I go to work f with people that I don't even care as much about. Yeah. But I do that all day long, and then by the end of the day, when I'm tired, <laughs> I'm smelly and everything else, I step into the house for the people that I care the most about. And he says, so what you do is you put your hand on the doorknob as you're about to walk in the door, and you realize on the other side of that door are the people that you want to give your entire life to. Yeah. And so he says, at that point, I stop and realize that these people are the ones I want to love the most. So when I get home from work, the th 
thought in my heart is that I this is when my work starts. So yeah. instead of just flopping on the couch and saying I'm exhausted and laying around, that instead I realize this is where I really want to put out my best. And that was advice from my dad. And it's helped me a lot because I, I still come home from work tired sometimes yeah. and you just don't want to do anything. But it reminds me, especially as we talked about earlier, if I'm here to serve my spouse, if I want to love Eugenie with everything that I can, when I come home from work, instead of me giving her whatever's left over, can I step it up and stop and say, this is the person that I care the most about. I want to give her yeah. my best. That's good. I, um, when I, when I was engaged to Lucy, we went to this coffee shop and there's a barista, an older lady. Um, and, and I was like, if you could give us any marriage advice, what would you give us? And she lit up as if she's been waiting her whole life for someone to ask. And, and she goes, Oh, I've got the, the perfect advice for you. And she looked at Lucy and she goes, he's going to work hard. And she goes, and when he comes home, he's going to be exhausted. She goes, give him 15 minutes to decompress. Um, and then she looks at me and she goes, and she's going to be raising kids and she's going to be having conversations with people that are not her age. And she, and she's going to need some adult conversation. So after she gives you your 15 minutes, you give her your ear and you listen well and yeah, you, you let her good. talk. And, um, and so there are times when we've, Lucy and I first got married and I'd come home and I'd hear the, the timer on the oven, like, doo, doo, doo. So she, I was always like, Oh no, <laughs> there it is. Not 15 minutes is up. Um, and I would say that that was great advice for a season. It had a shelf life yeah. because as yeah. kids get older, eventually like, it's like, yeah, that 15 minutes is no longer an option, yeah. but it was, it was, it's for a season. That was actually some good advice. And then at least it set the tone of our marriage to know, like, at least that, like, like, hey, there's going to be some exhaustion. There's going to be some need to, to lend an ear. So the principle still. Yeah. Surprising. And that tone, I think, is important that you you do establish some principles in there. Um, we were talking the other day about uh, we were over at a, a restaurant here downtown and um, – Eugenie and I were waiting for our table and a guy was leaving. He was with a gal and he saw us and said, you guys look really happy together. You're laughing. You're having a great time. Are you married? And we were like, yeah. And, and so how long? And so we gave him, told him, you know, how long we've been married. And he's like, well, what's the marriage advice? You know, and suddenly you're stuck on the spot on yeah. that one. And I just said, well, probably the number one is that you go into marriage being fully committed to love that person for the rest of your life. The divorce is not an option. Yeah. And in that part, we had a great conversation about that. And even the hostess of the restaurant who was listening to the entire thing, she stopped and said, I have never heard that before. And you think about it and think oh, she's starting her life and is likely going to find a guy out there. Yeah. But the question in their mind is not even to have that that foundational principle of marriage is forever, that yeah. I'm looking for one person I want to spend the rest of my life with. So even as we talk through advice, the idea of getting those key principles that can help you in your marriage, those are important. Yeah. It's It uh, becomes the foundational blocks, the touchstones that we can use in the more difficult days. Yeah, that's good. Well, um, as you're talking, I thought of one more piece of advice that I received. Um, so Lucy and I, we, we kind of had, when we got married, we we're, you know, we we're in our mid twenties and we had a couple in their mid thirties that we looked to and there, they had some young kids just like, Hey, this is a couple we'd like to be like when we have young kids. Then we had some people about our parents' age that we thought, man, we're, we're empty nesters. This is kind of, and then we had like an adopted grandparent. Uh, it's like when we're, <laughs> Or our grandparents. These are the type of people we want to be. And um, and so that was Harry and Eloise Davis. And he, she, went, she went by Wheezy, um, yeah. which is awesome. Great they, name. they just took us in and we would sit on their back porch, um, a screened in back porch, and just talk life. And um, and like I remember sitting there thinking the whole idea of two becoming one, it's almost like they had ran that race to completion. Yeah. You're going to know Harry, to know Wheezy, to know Wheezy, to know Harry. But I remember asking them for advice and Harry looked at me and he said, Never stop learning about Lucy. Uh, and he goes, to this day, I can say, Wheezy, tell me something I don't know. And he said, and she can come up with something. And so, um, and so Lucy and I, if we were, if we go on date night, sometimes that's the question, you know, tell me something I don't know. And you could be like, oh, in second grade, I, you know, I did this, like, you're like a random memory. It's like, she didn't know that. Like, it's so, you know, there's obviously some bigger things and I'm sure it gets tougher as years go by, but I thought, man, here are people in their early nineties and they're still learning each other. Um, how cool is that? So that, yeah. that, I thought that was some good advice from Harry. You know, yeah. just continue to learn. Well, that's excellent. We we have a couple of illustrations we use when we're doing marriage counseling with couples. And 
Um, one of them is what we refer to as the donut shop. And it's the idea when you first get married, you know, if I get a job in the donut shop where we get married, we have our honeymoon, we're all in love. We think this is all wonderful. And then I go off to work and I'm making donuts. And so um, I come home at the end of the day smelling like, you know, <laughs> donuts. And Eugenie would ask me, well, how was your day today? Oh, it's the coolest thing ever. I learned how maple bars are made, you know, and how they put the sprinkles on. This is the coolest thing. Well, then after a couple of weeks of how's your day today? Oh, it was great. Made more maple bars. I made more than last week. You that, know, that, that kind of thing. What is, what is a maple bar? A maple bar? bar? Yeah, I've never heard that one. Oh, <laughs> I'll bring in some tomorrow. Oh, well, we're not. I'm off tomorrow, but That's the Sunday. Thing, yeah. California thing. Yeah. I think it's local. We'll see. I'll find <laughs> one. So it, that process, though, after a week, after two weeks, after three weeks, after two years, when you come home from work, how was your work today? You know. She don't want to hear about maple bars. Yeah. And what happens oftentimes in marriages is that when we come home and we do the exact same things and we, we, after a while, you're like, what do we talk about? Yeah. And so then it becomes an issue of where that advice they gave you is exactly right. It's that point where we have to realize there's a responsibility for us to continue to explore one another. When we first meet each other, then we're typically, you, you meet your, your, your mate out there somewhere, you're standing out in the street or in a parking lot after everybody's gone away. And now it's 1130, 130 in the morning, and you're still having a conversation about stuff that yeah. doesn't even matter, but you're just excited to be with each other. But why it's exciting is that there's somebody exploring you. There's somebody asking questions about you. There's somebody getting to know you. Yeah. And that makes us come alive. And so what happens is once you get married, you tend to just stop and go, well, I made maple bars today. And you're like, well, great. Uh, you made maple bars for the last 20 years. Yeah. Well, you know, what's going on? And I, what I love about that is if you're walking with the Lord, he's taking you out on an adventure every day. And if you're obedient to him, he's not going to let you live a normal day. Yeah. And so when you come home at the end of the day, he's going to, she's going to say, Hey, what'd you do today? And you're going to go, well, you won't believe what happened today. Yeah. And that's that ability for both of us to explore each other, to say, Hey, what happened today? What, why did that happen? And, and then it becomes a little bit of an adventure exploring each other as well. Yeah. Love it. Well, let's, let's speaking of love, let's talk love. Yeah. Um, so we went through song of songs a couple of years ago and, and something that commentators will point out, are there three different words used for love throughout the letter? And so there's, there's a Hebrew word that means friendship. It's like, you're my best friend. Um, there's a Hebrew word for commitment. It's, it's, I know all of your flaws and I'm not going anywhere. It's like, I've seen you at your best. I've also seen you at your worst and I'm still in. And then there's a love for attraction. It's like, man, I, I, I like you. <laughs> um, it's That's a, my favorite one. Yeah. yeah. Um, so here, here's, here's a question. How do you keep the friendship alive? You know, other, other than uh, ex continue to explore each other and to, to, to know things like any other tips on, on keeping the friendship alive as, as you, as you get married? Yeah, I think it's, uh, there's like books are written on this, right? Um, that's the, that's the magic sauce. If somebody can figure out how to not let their relationship grow stale. And I think it is a sense of romanticism. It's the, the idea that you come into it and you realize it's a lifelong journey to get to know the other person. Yeah. You don't do it after the first year. It's not like you stop doing it. It means you won't have achieved it after the first year. It's going to take you a lifetime to get there. Yeah. Like literally, if you see people that are still passionate and love when they're celebrating their 50th anniversary, those are the people we want to go to and yeah. go, how did you do this? Um, that concept, I think, is much of what we just talked about. It's the idea of realizing that there's another human being, a soul, that, that God has allowed you to spend your life with, and you have a bit of a responsibility to explore them, to court them, to get to know them, to care for them, to serve them. And so they should, they should constantly be under your study of yeah. how do I love this person more? And when I was younger, it literally haunted me that I could lose my wife because I didn't love her enough to where she felt that. Yeah. And in the process, if all it took was for somebody else. Like if I'm only talking about maple bars and sprinkled donuts, then after a while she's going to go, yeah, but what about me? And that ability to pursue her, to love her, to find new ways to say that I love you. 
Because so often what happens is if I come home and I say, hey, I love you, I walk out at the morning, I, I love you. I remember the first time Eugenie said, I love you. And I stayed up awake at night playing it over and over in my head. It was like magical. I couldn't believe that she'd said it. Well, then you stop and go, well, after 10 years of marriage, can I remember the time she said, I love you? And it fades. Yeah. So then it's our responsibility to find new ways to say, I love you. What are the things that would actually resonate with her to where she would feel love? Yeah. And that's a different game. But if I love her, then I'm exploring her. I'm finding out the things that, that literally just thrill her. Yeah. And why would I not want to be the one person on the planet who can do that better than any other human being? Yeah. I love the the challenge, you know, to to if we're if we're having a man a man night and talking about how do we become better husbands. Yeah. You know, how about this week? Um, you tell your wife you love her because it's like because well, I love you is pretty easy, but you can't say because unless you're doing the work yep. of knowing. So I love that idea of of kind of coming up with new things. It's like so that so it's not just I love you. It's like I love you because the the way that you tuck our kids in at night, like. And the, the way they look back at you just makes me think like you are the most important person to them in this moment. You know, yeah. Like, well, and uh, I would give the guys advice because I love that. I think that the thing about it is, is you should think of that answer when she's not around. Yeah. And before, <laughs> before she asks it, why do you love me? Uh, yeah. You know, that's not a good response. <laughs> The, the right response is that I think about this all the time, you know, that who she is in my life and what she does. So then when that conversation comes up, I don't have to wait for her to ask. I have to, I have the ability to say, here's why. Yeah. So I think that's, that's great advice. So, um, when I think about, about friendship, um, something that they, I did um, an intensive on how to recharge because in ministry, you're constantly pouring yourself out. And we've talked about just marriage in general. You come home from work, you're exhausted. And so one of the things was, well, you can't, you can't recreate time. You can't create more time, but how do you replenish energy? How do you restore that? And so we looked at just what are the things that charge me and, um, and I discovered that actually time away with Lucy and I, just us, like I love traveling with our kids. I love adventuring, but when Lucy and I get away on our own, it's a supercharger. Yep. To my, to my, like it fills my tank in a way that I'm like, I can go another six months, whatever it is. And, um, but one of my favorite things about those times away is, is we're 14 years deep. I'm not 44, but, um, but to this day, like every time we, we just did it in October and like, uh, and one of my favorite things is yes, the hikes are cool. Yeah. The food was cool. Yeah. The, the adventure was cool, but coming back, I'm like, she's still my best friend. Yeah. That, that's the best part for yeah. me is, is the realization. It's that reminder. Like, yeah, we're still, and it's like, let's, if we can do this until our kids get out of this, the house. The last thing you want to do is the kids get out of the house and you're like, I don't even know this person I'm married to. Yeah. You know, I want to, I want them to get out of the house and be like, yeah, this is still my best friend. Yeah. So anyways, so let's, let's move on. So we had friendship love. The next one is, is, is commitment love. And so this is, this is, like I said, it's, it's really, I know all your flaws. I'm not going anywhere. And, um, and so I sit down with pre-married, pre-married, you cut or like premarital counselings and see people and I'm, I'm going, you can put your best foot forward for a while. You know, you you can go a few months, even a year of not showing your flaws, but eventually they're going to come out. But do you have any thoughts on, on commitment? I love what you said earlier, just at the restaurant being like, we resolved to never divorce, but any, any other thoughts on commitment? Yeah. Eugenie and I did this thing where, um, when we were first engaged and married, it actually what turned out to be the rings. Um, yeah. the, so we had the. We had the engagement ring, had the diamond on it, very small little speck of a diamond at the time. Um, and then it had two gold bands beside that. So three rings total. And in, for us, we chose that because we wanted that center ring to represent God, that if our marriage was doing what God wanted it to do, it would represent that bond between Christ and the church, yeah. that, that all throughout scripture, God uses the example of marriage for his relationship with us. So we wanted our marriage to be like that, to honor God. So we chose that ring thing. And what happened is, uh, I don't, we'll do it this way. So <laughs> this candle, you can imagine is that ring with the diamond. And then we got a pin there. That'll be me. And the glasses will be Eugenie kind of thing. Well, those rings, they look best when they're right all together. Yeah. The three rings are just like that. But what happens is if I start being a jerk and I start doing things and I start drifting away from God, I'm also drifting away from Eugenie. Yeah. 
Yeah. In our marriage, we will feel that. And so for us, what we talked about was the the whole idea that if if I'm here and I'm feeling distant from you, Jeannie, the one thing that I can do better than anything else is to simply get back and right with God. Yeah. Is not and for Eugenie, the thing isn't to leave God to chase me down. That's gonna draw her away from God. Or the right thing for her to do is to actually just get right with God. That's as close as she can possibly get to me. Yeah. And yet she's got the best helper in that process that is going to be able to reach me as well. So for us, the commitment is just that, is that when we started in our marriage early on, we made that commitment to each other that God would be first and foremost, and that our marriage would be best when God was center of that. And so whenever we would start snipping at each other, or one's you know not doing well, and, and, and it goes both ways. Sometimes it's me, sometimes it's her, sometimes it's both. Yeah. But the process is as soon as we start snapping at each other, we can think of that principle of the rings and go, oh, wait a minute. I'm, I'm, it's not because of you. It's because I'm not even right with God right now. Yeah. And the one thing I need to do is to get right with God so that our marriage will be right and I can serve. Because even if I want to love her and sacrifice for her, the way I get the ability to do that is to be walking with the Lord. Yeah. So that's a commitment to say, I, I'm not going to accept the option that I'm going to stay over here and pout and do my own mm-hmm. thing or be frustrated and just go, well, he, you know, if Eugenie just stops and says he's being a jerk and whenever he comes back, then, then I'll be fine. And then she drifts away. Our marriage will just get colder and colder and colder. Yeah. The right thing for us to do is to say, we're in this for the long haul. We want to be married forever. And therefore we're going to do our best to pursue that and keep it healthy. Yeah, that's good. Um, the next one is attraction. And so I've, I've had this question, like, what if like he's such a good guy and I'm just not attracted to him. And in my mind, I'm like, don't marry him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like the honeymoon to happen and cry. Like I was attracted to your heart. It's like, like, so I think I think physical attraction is okay. I, I'm I'm a proponent of saying it's okay to to desire to be attracted to the person you get married to, but once you get married, you know there's there's thing this would show like on one hand you could make a case to say like hey don't let yourself go, you know like if you're a guy don't don't give in to like living in the basement eating Doritos all day and gaining you know sixty pounds or your wife would be like I just, yeah kind yeah. of like you're better when you're <laughs> anyways. But what I love about Song of Songs is when when the relationship's young. And the man is talking about her. He starts at her eyes and kind of moves down. He he talks about everything. Um, Mm -hmm. But as the relationship matures, as they get older, he starts at her feet, which is like the the least desirable thing in someone. But it's really painting this picture that that as as they've been with each other, he's beginning to be attracted to to things that aren't as physical. And so um, so I I love that I would say... Thankfully, I'm still attracted to my wife um, physically, but at the same time, the longer we've been married, I find myself being attracted to all these other little things. Is there any any thoughts for you on a, on the attraction side as, as you as you're in marriage, how to how to build attraction or how to maintain it or how to how to discover it? Yeah, well, I think it's a it's a great question, and I think it's one that that we would say that guys struggle with more, uh, you know, because some, some guys give themselves into lust of the flesh. And so they're out there looking with their eyes and, you know, just trying to entertain themselves off of just physical attraction. Yeah, can, can I I'll stop there for a second? Yeah. This is actually a pretty big deal. Um, you're robbing your wife. Mm. If you're out like gazing at other women, checking them out or looking at stuff online, you shouldn't be looking at um, or, or fantasizing you're robbing your wife because you're going to become less attracted to her. Um, and so, so I just, like, I just, I, th- I think don't just see it as like, Oh, I shouldn't do this. It's like, no, you're robbing your wife of an intimacy that God has called you to give. And so, yeah. And I would even go and say that you're also corroding yourself, mm, yeah, yeah. that it's eating you out from the inside, mm-hmm. that it, it's literally destroying you and destroying your ability to love and appreciate what God has given you. So that's an important one right off the bat. Yeah. But then I also think that the, the concept of falling in love with that person is the the more you fall in love, you 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 just get almost giddy with the things you discover in them, and so for me, um, and I, I might get in trouble for this, but but I've been married, you know, going on forty four years, and so there are smile lines that Eugenie has. Yeah, um, I won't call them wrinkles; they're smile lines. <laughs> 
<laughs> but but those are from the years we've spent together. That's from the laughter we've had. That's some some of the crying that we've done together. It's the thing that when I look at her face, uh, I look at that and go, "That's our life together." Yeah. And there's a beauty there that transcends that beauty of some young teenage girl yeah. that when I'm 16, I might have been attracted to, but you look at it now and you stop and go, that, that's not attractive to me. And, you know, it's not that there isn't a pretty 16 year old girl out there, but I look at it and what I'm looking for is I'm looking for that person that we've gone through life with. And there, there's that beauty that's hidden in that face. Yeah. And I look at it and go, when I was younger, I always looked at old people and thought, oh, they're old. How could they even like each other? You know, and then wisdom of the years, you start to see it and you realize there's a far deeper beauty that, that continues to come, but it comes when you pursue that in the relationship. Yeah. So it's something that you continue to work at, but I, uh, I agree with that as well. And it's something you also have to work at. Like yeah. uh, you alluded to that, that, you know, we, we shouldn't just let ourselves go. And that's not just physically, it's who we are as a person. Oh, yeah. If we're not developing our, you know, that very beginning, very you know, true. it's not so much finding the right person as being the right person. It's not once I get married, I get to put that list away i still get to develop myself to be that person that eugenie would crave and want to spend time with yeah so that even allows us that if i'm being that person eugenie then responds differently to me and then that makes me respond to her and the whole thing spirals up and it gets out of hand and yeah. this is probably just a pg podcast so we'll stop right there stop there okay. yeah so let's let's move on to conflict um a couple of years ago i was doing a wedding and um and I, I thought I was going to add this thing about how marriage is under attack, you know, and, and I said, you know, think about the Garden of Eden, how many people at the first wedding and the wife was like two and the husband, the groom was like, you know, three, like Adam, Eve and God. And I was like, and think about it, like at present in this moment, a fourth person shows up, the serpent. And I kid you not, it's an outdoor wedding, a, like a six foot black snake falls off the roof behind us and hits the ground. And slithers up a tree. Like no one heard a word I said, but like, did you like cue, cue the snake? Yeah. Um, so, you bring those to every wedding yeah, now. Just, <laughs> like, yeah, I brought a snake, totally planned it. <laughs> but the point is being like, hey, like Satan often waits to truly attack the relationship until you've said I do. Because if he can destroy his individual, he'll destroy an individual. But if he can wreck a marriage, he can impact generations. And so, so when the wedding ends, really that's when the battle begins. So, 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 so like, don't be surprised when marriage gets tough. Don't be surprised when you feel like it's under attack. Um, but we can prepare ourselves for it. And so, one of the things is, I would say, when whenever I do, whenever I meet with couples, a lot, one of the big things are like communication or conflict, conflict resolution. And so. Um, when it comes to when it comes to conflict, what, what would you say are some of the, the the things that cause like that you've seen cause conflict in marriages? Are there some big ticket items like, hey, these are, these seem to be the the culprit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, they're the big things in life. Money is often one. Uh, time and how we spend it. What are the priorities? Um, you know, if if we keep certain hobbies or things that we spend our time with, and it has nothing to do with the other person, that can you know work. Um, how, we're, if we're too involved in work, that can become a problem. It's, it's the big things of life that create the normal stressors. We bring those into our marriage and we might have a slightly different perspective on how things go. And so then that creates a tension. Even the idea of, are we going to have kids? Can we have kids? You know, those kinds of things can be yeah. pretty stressful. Yeah. Um, so have you ever experienced conflict? No, never. Okay. Yeah. So you can't speak into this, but I can. No, um, I would say you know, Lucy and I did a, a marriage intensive a couple of years ago and, and it wasn't like, Hey, our marriage is falling apart. It was, we could use a tune up, you know, and, yeah. and just have some people speak into us. And, and, um, and it turns out Lucy and I are not the best at communicating. We're, we're passive people. We had, we both have passive parents. And so we, we'd rather just, maybe if we don't talk about it, it'll go away in a couple of days. And then it turns out they just build for a couple of months and mm -hmm. then it all what waterfalls. Yeah. But, um, but we were given this framework that I thought was so helpful. And then our counselor called it the ABCs of conflict resolution. He said, so start off um, of an event. When? When you dot, dot, dot. Then a feeling. I felt, fill in the blank, um, what I needed was. And so he said, so let's, let's put this into practice. And so it could be something as simple as when you got home from work and you changed clothes and immediately went for a run. It's like, I can't argue. It's like, I 100% got home, threw on the shorts, and I was out the door. Um, I felt 
like you didn't care about my day. Like I can't like argue with the way you felt. What I needed was for you to come in and just to sit and talk to me for 20 to 30 minutes before you went on your run. All of a sudden, like now we've walked through the event, the feeling, the need, and and like that was just a helpful. And I'll I'll have couples do that, and it always feels yeah. awkward. And then you almost feel like, well, now they're doing it to me. They're doing the ABCs, um, but it really does help make it through conflict in a in a more structured way. But have you ever had any any good advice for for walking through conflict? That you're like, man, this 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 helped us. Yeah, well, and that's just it, right? The the whole steps of that is so that you understand the other person's perspective. Mm-hmm. And, you know, even right now, um, we just had an election and there's conflict. If you've been on social media, there's a few people that that don't like other people, you know, just based on a, a vote or whatever that is. The, the concept, though, is that if you want to be friends with somebody, the, the best thing to do is to stop and listen to them. Yeah. Why? Why are you feeling this way? Why did you vote this way? You know, that's what you would do with the election. Well, why wouldn't you do that with your spouse? Why wouldn't you stop and say, let me understand why you're feeling what you're feeling. And let, let me try to help you understand why I'm feeling what I'm feeling. So oftentimes listening and just stopping and saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. That because the consequence is we fight with each other and pretty soon our relationship grows distant and we don't love each other yeah. anymore. And it's like, oh yeah, that's a great trade-off. You know, well, I didn't get married so that I could be mad at a person for the rest of my yeah. life. I got married so it can be romantic all the way to the end. Um, that concept means that I need to continue to pursue her, even when we're not our favorite people right then. You know, in other words, there's times Eugenie says or does something, and I'm like, oh, man, you got to be kidding me. And I know that I do that far more to her, and she's yeah. feeling the same way. But that ability to stop and do just that is to stop and listen and try to understand why they're feeling that way and what role I can be, you know, and not be a fixer that I've just got to go in and try to, you know, take care of it so I can get on to whatever I was going to do. Have you ever seen the video, It's Not About the Nail? Oh, yes. (laughs) We should put a link in that to that because that is... That's great. I just feel... (laughs) If you would just... (laughs) Carter, if you can put that... In the show notes, the the nail, not about the nail. <laughs> I have felt that so many times. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. So what? So here, I had some scattershot questions before we move on to parenting. One of them was, how do you? Any tips on apologizing? So that kind of, I think it ties into conflict. I, I've got one tip that's been helpful for me. But do you, how do you how do you apologize? You said it's simple yesterday. What? And you do it. <laughs> just do it. I mean, and that's it. It's like doing it's half the battle. It, it, well, it's almost the whole battle. Yeah. It, it literally is that ability to humble ourselves and to stop and say, wait a minute, is there a likelihood that I had some role in doing this wrong and creating this moment that has created the conflict? Yes, is the answer. Mm-hmm. Always, you know, and so you look at it and say, That ability to take a knee and to step down and to humble yourself and to to take it in a a position of serving is have this mind in you that was also in Christ Jesus who emptied himself. So here he is, God, and he comes down to that marriage relationship and dies on the cross. He he lowers himself to that level. So the first thing when we're in in that kind of conflict, one of the first things we should do is stop and think, wait a minute, what's my role in this? How can I apologize for the role that I did? Because I I can't change her, she can't change me, but I can affect me. Yeah. I can stop and say, wait a minute, I'm going to take a knee. I'm going to get down on a knee and say, I'm so sorry. I'm yeah. sorry we're here, and I am sorry for the things that I've done. So typically it's our pride that says, no, 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 yeah. you did that part, and I'm not doing a thing until you get your part taken on, taken care of. And yeah. it's like, ah, no, just stop. You know, apologize, get on your knee. And I don't mean sometimes physically on your knee, but I mean, inside, we've got to bow down and humble ourselves. My eighth grade homeroom teacher, her name was Miss Humphrey. Um, And if you ever said you were sorry and she go, I know you are now apologize. (laughs) (laughs) But thinking about it, tell me why it's not just, I'm sorry. It's like, Hey, I'm sorry for. Yeah. And then, um, and obviously like I've seen some people that are masters of the non-apology, which is I'm sorry, Mm -hmm. but and they and they can they and almost like you feel like you're like well, I guess I shouldn't have felt that way because they just justified everything they did, and so my advice is say you're sorry for, and then don't don't try to justify it. Just just own if, it. If, if you feel like you need to, just own it. Let it be. It, it'll, and that that feels more like a true apology than I just went on a I said I'm sorry for, but then I went on a five minute rant on on why I did what I did or why, yeah, here's why the, you shouldn't feel the way you feel. Here's the beautiful thing about marriage is if you're doing that. 
the, the Holy Spirit can use that conflict to actually change you, to shape you, to make you better. Because in the moment, it's going to reveal flaws you have. Yeah. And at that moment, if you stop and go, wait a minute, if did I handle this wrong? Did I say something wrong? Did I treat you wrong? And the minute you see it, you get to make it better, and your marriage gets better, and you become better. Yeah. So the idea of owning it and identifying it is so good because it makes you better, it makes the marriage better, and it it, it ends the argument. I yeah. mean, not fully, depends on how bad the conflict is, but it, it oftentimes just takes the air out of the, the room if or the, that the fire needs to burn is if you just own it and you suck it up. Yeah, yeah. All right, the last question on marriage. Any any tips on how to how to divorce proof your marriage? Mm, don't. <laughs> That's good. I, so when I think about this, um, I, I'm trying to think how much details to share. I'll just I'll I'll, I'll pull back. There was someone who was giving me marriage advice, um, who was going through unknowingly was going through a divorce. Like I didn't know that his wife had left him and I know that their marriage about to fall apart. And so when, when I put the time in together, when he gave me this advice, I was going, Oh, this wasn't as much for me as it was. This is what he wish he would have done. And um, he goes, Jeff, he goes, your marriage is like a piggy bank. And he goes, he's like, and you're constantly making deposits into it. You know, things like your hair looks nice today, or I love you because or whatever it is. Like, he's like, these are all deposits. He said, when your wife's piggy bank is full, he goes, no one else can make a deposit. He goes, but if you stop making deposits, he goes, eventually another man will, whether knowingly or unknowingly. So, so if a coworker of hers says, oh, did you get your hair cut? And you didn't notice it and you didn't make a comment. All of a sudden he's put a deposit because there's room. If, if, if there was filled, that wouldn't have been able to go in. But because yep. you had done it, it goes in. And then she might even begin subconsciously or consciously trying to Get some of those, like, like she starts kind of going out of her way to walk by him because he's like, oh, you're like your dress today. And all of a sudden in, in a deposit, he said, but eventually he goes, if, if another man makes enough deposits in her tank, when you realize it, it's full and now you can't make a deposit in her tank. Yeah. And, um, and so, and then I realized like, oh my God, like eventually it clicked, but I, but I thought, I still thought, man, one of the ways to divorce proof your marriage is to continually make deposits yeah. um, into, into the marriage, not keep the tank full the, the the piggy bank full so that another man can't can't make a deposit. Yep. So I totally agree with that. I think that's that that thing where you stop and say, hey, if I've been given this person, um, God hands us this individual, another human being to love for the rest of our life, then that means I need to be a student of her and continue to find ways to do just that. Fill right. the piggy bank to love her in ways to say I love you in new ways that she's not heard before. That that makes me a, a student of her. Uh, to stop and say, and the person I love when she's in her 20s is going to be different in her 30s or 40s or 50s or 60s yeah. or 70s. Or like the person I married. I'm like, yeah, no done. You're not the person she married. Yeah. And <laughs> how fun is it that you would still be, that others would look at you and think what a beautiful marriage they have. Yeah. Well, that takes work. But that mentality, so, you know, I kid at the beginning when say, well, to divorce proof your marriage, just don't. But there's a mentality there that says that's not an option. So then you look at it and go, well, if your marriage is going through a rough s stretch, if you think, well, if it doesn't work, I'm just out of here, you're going to choose that path when it gets rough. Yeah. But if you look at it and go, well, I don't want that path, then I don't want to live in a miserable marriage. Then the other option is, then I got to work on my marriage and make it better. Yeah. So then it's a matter of pursuing that person and, and, and changing yourself as well to become a great husband, a great wife and bringing beauty to it. I'd add the the last thing of just that concept of um, there's this, this story in Hosea um, where uh, he, as a prophet, is told by God to go marry a prostitute. And uh, it's bad enough that she's a prostitute. It's worth that her name is Gomer. And you're just like, who marries somebody named Gomer? Um, that's probably not nice if there's anybody we know out there that named yeah, Gomer. Um, Dorcas and Axe. It's yeah. Like, oh, Dorcas? Yeah. But what what happens is is that um, Gomer goes out back to her old lovers, and God's answer to Hosea is go and buy her back. And it's like that's his wife; he shouldn't yeah. have to pay anything. But God says go buy her back, 
And I love the principle of that. I love the idea of that, that when, when God stops and says, if you want to do marriage the way I would see it, there's never a reason for divorce, that you would pursue that person even if they cheat on you. So oftentimes with um, young couples that are going, how do I know when I've found the right one? I, I bring that story up. Yeah. And I go, if you know that you would be willing to take a hit like that and still pursue that person, you absolutely know that's the right one. And it doesn't mean you have to do that, but to know that I'm gonna commit to the marriage, that I'm gonna pursue my spouse regardless all the way, that helps you divorce proof it because there's just not another path. There's only the path of I will continue to pursue, doesn't matter what you do. And well, those are the vows. In sickness and health, it doesn't matter. I'm with you forever. That's good. Well, um, I think we should make this a two-part series on on marriage and parenting. So we'll, we'll call it quits. On we 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 could keep talking marriage yeah. for a long time. Yeah. Um, but we'll we'll end this episode, and then you'll have to catch the next one for for parenting. So next episode, parenting with Jeff Lilly. <laughs>